you, John. Welcome to Queensland's own Today Tonight. A little later, Darren Hinch is back in a courtroom, but in a very different role. But we start with the television first, a special behind-the-scenes report on Australia's biggest outlaw motorcycle gang, the Rebels. A national task force has vowed to smash the Rebels' bikey gang. They're being investigated by an unprecedented 14 state and federal agencies. Neil Dawley has this exclusive report. <laughs> They say they're misunderstood. The authorities say they're a highly organised criminal organisation with tentacles spreading around the world. We are targeting people we believe um, are criminals and also pose a great risk to uh, members of the public. We don't go looking for it, but it's, you know, we're, not, we're never going to back away from anywhere that wants it, you know. They are the Rebels, Australia's largest outlaw motorcycle gang with an estimated 2,000 members split into more than 60 chapters across the country. Yeah, it's probably the brotherhood, yeah. Where loyalty, trust and getting the club's colours mean everything. Rebels forever, forever rebel, you know, but um, it's just while you've got this patch on your back, that's, that's sort of what you're, uh, you know, just a motto of, of uh, what we're all about, that's all. John Parker is one of the Rebels' longest-serving members and president of their mother chapter in Brisbane. We're just a mob of guys that like riding motorbikes. It's our hobby. The first ever chapter of the Rebels was founded in Brisbane in 1969 and they have a few mementos gathered over the years. And not the sort of thing a normal motorcycle club would expect to collect. We are targeting people we believe um, are criminals and also pose a great risk to uh, members of the public. After months of meetings and what can best be described as a feeling out period, the rebels have invited us to tag along. The only condition was that they didn't want us to show the faces of some half-naked women in the clubhouse. Nothing else was off limits. We've even been invited on a ride to Canberra. No news organisation or reporter, certainly in this country, has ever been given such access to an outlaw motorcycle gang. Let's see what happens. Inside the Rebels, it's strictly members only. Bikey business is done in private. Make no mistake, this is a public relations exercise for them, as bikey gangs have been getting a lot of attention of late and they don't like it. I just want to let people know, just get the story straight. You know, there are guys out there that ride motorcycles that probably do get into a lot of trouble. But that doesn't mean everybody, you know, is a bad person just because they ride a motorcycle with a set of colours on their back. <laughs> You joined back in 1972. Why? Oh, I was just a uh, few mates were in the club. From half a dozen members, the Rebels are now an international franchise. Did you think you'd see the day when the Rebels would have chapters around the world? Never in my wildest dreams. Like a growing army, the Rebels rely heavily on obedience to rank and a code of conduct that includes members attending weekly meetings in clubhouses right across the country. You know, some people might think it's some sort of secret meeting about what we're going to get up to, but it's not that at all. It's just a few beers, have a laugh and, you know, maybe plan our next run or our next holiday party or whatever. No, I'm not suggesting that uh, all members of outlaw motorcycle gangs have criminal convictions or criminal histories, but quite a lot do. Detective Inspector Gary Watts heads up Task Force Hydra, the specialist police unit created to deal with Queensland bikey gangs. Since the inception of Task Force Hydra, we've uh, arrested and charged over 450 people with uh, about 3,500 charges. Now, all, now, not all those people are outlaw motorcycle gang members, but certainly the majority would be. He says while John Parker may be in it for long rides and parties, some others join and use a bikey club's reputation for organised crime, running protection rackets, extortion and drug distribution. 
Well, certainly drug trafficking and the, uh, the trafficking of amphetamines and, uh, and MDMA and other uh, pills is a, a mainstay of some criminal networks operating within outlaw motorcycle gang members. I'm sure no drug dealer's going to be riding around with a set of colours on his back, a German helmet and some noisy pipes on his Harley, you know, it just, I don't think that works. And it didn't for former Rebels president of the Fraser Coast chapter, Adam McRae, who's just been jailed for seven years after pleading guilty to eight charges of possessing and supplying various drugs. McRae, who was on welfare, used limousines to transport drugs from the Gold Coast to Harvey Bay for distribution. It's proof that it's fact that these people, or some of these members of the outlaw motorcycle gangs, are involved in serious crime. John Parker says these characters are the exception rather than the norm in the club, rebels within the rebels, if you like, and they are dealt with. It's an individual thing. No, no way in the world it's club organised. You know, anybody that ever gets, you know, or especially even in, in our club, that might get into trouble for doing something wrong, it's never ever a club organised thing. The gang itself hands out punishment to members breaking the law. You know, they'll have their bikes confiscated off them and thrown out of the club immediately. Do you have a criminal record? No, just traffic offences, that's all. I haven't got no criminal history whatsoever. But wherever they go, police follow and watch them, especially on their annual runs. All members are expected to take part. Only those in hospital or jail are excused. Generally when we go on a run, there's a lot of us in one big group and uh, the, you know, the sound and, and the atmosphere, it's just amazing. Stephen Tapo Keeley is one of the club's newest members. The part I like is um, I, get to, I get to ride my motorcycle all over Australia. It's just like our yearly holiday, like, you know, we'd just pack up and forget everything that you you're left behind. Everything except a large police contingent with officers ready and waiting as they leave for Canberra. It really is amazing the number of police involved in what so far has just been an escort. We've counted 13 cars and there are a few motorbikes as well in a convoy stretching about a kilometre along the highway. A police presence is felt the entire journey. They're checked for licences, roadworthies, noise violations, helmet compliance and, of course, drugs and alcohol. Well, I think that was the biggest waste of taxpayers' money that I've ever seen in my life. Is an element of it, though, getting under their skin? No, it's to ensure that they behave and they comply with the, the traffic regulations. Gary Watts makes no apologies for the zero-tolerance approach, regardless of what the offence is. Since we established the, the gauntlet policy, uh, we've seen traffic offending uh, reduced uh, to almost non-existent. Now they start a bike squad that just hounds the hell out of us. And they're supposed to be, they're supposed to be following us around to check organised crime. But they're booking us for helmets, noisy mufflers. And like I say to them, I said, mate, you know, is it, is it drugs, is it organised crime, or do you, you might as well just use the traffic branch to book us for helmets and noise. Detective Inspector Watts says in the past it's been found bikey gangs use non-members to manufacture and sell drugs. We've actually found a variety of networks operating, and the way they do business is quite different. But yes, we certainly have found that to remain um, aloof uh, or distant from the trafficking uh, seems to be an aim of uh, some of the more higher level members of outlaw motorcycle gangs. He says gangs also actively recruit new members to keep the club young and strong. Young males, uh, um, large, uh, physically imposing with a propensity to violence, seem to be attractive to them. For those who have been recruited, like Stephen Tapo Keeley, the road to becoming a rebel can be long and tedious. The club voted to make him a nominee member meaning he could go on rides but still had to perform menial jobs around their clubhouse. Your chores or your work could involve, you know, cooking the barbecue, um, serving drinks. Tapo had to wait 18 months before a second vote promoted him to being a full member and he finally earned his club colours. There's your colours, mate. Be proud of them. Very proud, very exciting. Um, just a, 
unbelievable feeling, really. Thanks, fellas. Now, to stay in, you'll have to follow the Rebels' rules, which govern how chapters are run. Congratulations, brother. Members must ride Harley Davidson's. It is a cooler bike to have. The vest that bears the Confederate flag must never be defaced. Colours remain the property of the club and members pay dues of $10 a week. They must only be worn when members are riding their bikes, never in cars. And colours must be handed back by members who can leave, but not to join another club. I don't think anybody would want to. I, I would never think about joining another club. When the Melbourne shooter Christopher Wayne Hudson defected from the Finks to the Hells Angels, the Finks shot him in the face. Also covered tattoos. Only members of more than five years can have club tattoos, but if you want one on your back, you'll have to wait ten. As for women, they can't join, be told, club business or even wear clothing like rebel t-shirts. We all look after our, our, uh, our girlfriends, wives, etc. Um, no, but I mean, this is, you know, it's a, you know, a boys exclusive club. But the Queensland government is trying to make sure they abide by even more rules. I do agree to witch hunt. Adam McGill is a former police officer turned lawyer. He defends bikies and is concerned gang members could be banned from associating with club mates under anti-association legislation. We don't live in a dictatorship, but these laws are indicating that's the direction we're going. Although similar laws have already failed in the courts in New South Wales and South Australia, that hasn't stopped Queensland police applying to have the Finks Motorcycle Club on the Gold Coast declared a criminal organisation. Essentially, they can tell you who you're allowed to contact, whether it be direct or indirect. If successful, the laws could be extended to other gangs, including the rebels. That would mean John Parker could be jailed simply for doing this, talking to his brother, another long-serving rebel. Well, how ridiculous is that? He's the vice president. Yes, yeah, how ridiculous is that? There's no shortage of evidence that bikey gangs are violent, dating back to the Milpera massacre, where the Bandidos and Comancheros staged a shootout in a hotel car park on the outskirts of Sydney. It saw seven people killed, including an innocent girl, and 28 people injured. Almost no major town with a bikey gang has been without some sort of violent altercation between clubs. Is it a fair comment that the violence is spilling out onto the streets? Um, it certainly has, and, and, and it has the potential to do. That's why we at the service take it so seriously. The Rebels, too, in Brisbane have seen violence at the hands of the Banditos. Their clubhouse was torched in 2007. Four Banditos were charged. Again, last year, the Rebels' clubhouse was riddled with bullets. Just before three this morning, a gunman fired at least 30 shots into the Rebels' clubhouse at Albion. Well, lucky nobody was hurt. We still don't know what that was about. Uh, the police have been trying to investigate it. Maybe if they used all those cops that were following us down the freeway the other day to do a bit of investigation, they might be a bit further down the track with that. One thing is certain, being a bikey may not mean you're a criminal, but does mean you're a marked man. The patch a target for police and other outlaws. In the end, it's that patch on their back it is what they're going to have to, uh, you know, be loyal to. Neil Dawley reporting there and Andrew Curry was the cameraman on that story. Tomorrow night, the bikey code of silence and the tactics used by the National Task Force to bring down the rebels. But after the break, Darren Hinch returns with a new segment, You Beat the Judge. Cast your verdict on real-life court cases. Victoria's alive. There'll be new shocks. So it's true. Even the devil himself didn't want you. In 
Welcome back as we begin a new segment with Darren Hinch. Tonight he's back in court but in a very different role, presenting a new segment, You Be the Judge. We'll be showing a number of controversial legal cases and giving viewers the opportunity to pass judgment. Here's how you do it. Simply download the Fango app from our website, yahoo7.com.au slash today tonight or from the app stores. After Darren presents the case, we'll return with the question and announce your verdict at the end of the segment. We'll be able to see in real time how you your verdict compares to the decision made by the actual judge. Here's Darren. Tonight, you be the judge. A woman is sent out of town by her boss, the federal government. She gets hurt having sex in a motel room. She sues her employer for compo. Should she get it? This is how it happened. The woman, we'll call her Brenda, because the courts suppressed her name, is sent to a country town to meet the staff and discuss dreary things like budgets. She decides to liven up her evening. In advance, she calls a bloke she'd met in that town a few weeks earlier and they arrange to have dinner. Drinks and dinner turn into something else. Between 10 o'clock and 11 p.m., according to court documents, they return to her motel. and start having sex. Now, what exactly happened next is unclear. A light fitting above the bed came down and brought things to an early climax. Brenda was cut on the nose and mouth, and later, she says, it caused her depression and anxiety. The question is, did the light fitting fall or was she holding on to it and, in the throes of passion, pull it down on top of herself? The male friend, the only witness, he wasn't much help. He said they were going hard and didn't know if they'd bumped the light or it just fell off. I think she was on her back when it happened, but I wasn't paying attention because we are rolling around. So, what's your verdict so far? I'll give you some hints. Workers' Comp originally decided to pay the work claim, but then changed its mind after more details came out about how the injuries actually occurred. Brenda appealed to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and it agreed with the boss. The compo claim was rejected. So, she took the case to federal court, where Judge John Nicholas obviously agreed with Brenda's lawyer, Leo Gray, when he claimed that having sex in your motel room while working out of town was as ordinary as having a shower or sleeping. She wasn't doing anything illegal. The tribunal had ruled earlier that the woman had been injured in a recreational activity and her injuries were of a private nature during her leisure time. But Judge Nicholas said that if the woman had been injured playing cards in a motel room, she would have been entitled to compensation. What if it was stripped jack naked? The government, perhaps sensing a dangerous libidinous precedent here, appealed the verdict to a full bench of the federal court. We'll have that decision after the break. Well, you've heard the details of the case. Now it's your chance to get involved. We're asking, did the public servant deserve compensation, yes or no? Head to Fango and let us know your thoughts. We'll have the result shortly. Hello, Bill McDonnell checking today's top stories. Police fear a 34-year-old Gold Coast mother who's been missing for almost a week has been murdered. A crime scene was set up at Novi Chardin's Upper Coomera home. Mr Chardin has flown to Indonesia with their two children. Police say they could be searching for more than one murderer after a 23-year-old Mackay woman was found dead near her home. Shandy Blackburn's family has made an emotional appeal to help catch her killer after holding a candlelight vigil overnight. An exclusive Seven News investigation has found Queensland children are drinking alcohol years earlier than previous generations. New research shows the average child has their first drink at just 12 years of age. And for the first time since Olivia Newton-John in 1975, 
an Australian has won the record of the year at the Grammys. Gautier picked up three awards, two for his worldwide hit, Somebody That I Used to Know. Congratulations to him. So that is the headlines now from the newsroom. Back to you, Sharon. Thank you, Bill. Now to the verdict on whether that public servant we called Brenda deserved workers' compensation for an injury sustained while having sex on a work trip. Here's Darren Hench with his thoughts on whether the courts got it right or wrong. Back to the case of Brenda. She was injured having sex while working out of town. Brenda was attached to the human relations section of a Commonwealth government agency. Well, she was certainly taking human relations seriously, even having some while off duty. The government said she wasn't entitled to compo. The appeals tribunal agreed. A federal court judge said she was. What do you think? There was an appeal before the full bench of the federal court, judges Keane, Buchan and Bromberg. In a 19-page judgment, they noted that the High Court has ruled that a man injured playing lunchtime cricket on the concrete outside a hangar where he worked was entitled to compensation from his boss. Is bedtime sex the same as lunchtime cricket? Hubie the judge. The appeals court judges ruled in her favour. Brenda got the money. You read this decision, and the first judge and the appeal judges, they legally got it right. And recently, Comcare has announced it's appealing to the High Court. My verdict. If the light fixture simply fell, then Brenda had a case to sue the motel. If she pulled it down in a moment of passion, then, sorry Brenda, that's life. In the court of common sense. Come on Brenda, you made your bed, lie in it. You just heard the decision of the federal court judge and Darren's verdict. But what do you think at home? The Fango results are in and 10% say the public servant did deserve compensation for her injury, while 90% believe workers' compensation shouldn't cover what happens under the sheets. Thanks for your company. I'm Sharon Gadella. Enjoy your evening.